it's real hard to preach prosperity. It's real hard to preach about houses and cars because people are dying every day. And it behooves us as Christians to really let our light shine because some of us in here are the only Bible or the only epistle, a living epistle that anyone will ever read. So this week I was just touched to go back to the basics because David reminded us, renew the joy of my salvation. It's so easy to become saved, but then now what? Some of us don't smile like we used to. I was looking at it, I ain't picking on nobody, but I was just observing with these little bitty eyes, I just observed. Some of us don't sing hymns no more. Some of us don't wanna pray no more, but I'ma tell you something, we better go back to the basics. Thank God for what we do have. You could've rolled by Indiana this morning and you would've had a whole lot of people that would've changed spots with you. You could have rolled by St. Luke's this morning. You could have you rolled by Southeast Texas Medical Center. I promise you, they'd have tagged you in and tagged out. They would have said, where you going? I'm going to church. But you come on in, you take my spot and I take yours. And I'm going there making a joyful noise. And I want you to look at the rock on the side. You all of us got a rock on the side of the support of Jesus. I, I want you to look down on the pew because there is a rock there. Now don't dispute it, just look down, it's there, I promise you. Because Jesus said, if you don't cry out, the rocks are proud in your place. So you ought to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God's been real good to me. So I'm going to stand to my feet, and I'm going to tell the Lord, thank you. I'm going to give him praise for things being as good as they are. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would have been 10 years ago. How blood pressure could have took me out there. Five years ago, somebody who had cancer could have been gone long ago. But you ought to tell your and say, by the grace of God, I am still here. And I need to open my mouth and proclaim and give God glory. Because he has been good to me and not only me, but also my family. Hey! You ought to look at your name and say, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, it wasn't my degrees, it wasn't what I make, it wasn't my pedigree, it wasn't because I was born on the right side of the track. It was God looking down on little old me and decided to have mercy on me. And now I need to open my mouth and tell the Lord, thank you for things being as good as they are. Hey, God has been He's been good. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I want you to look at your neighbor and say, don't just think that there's only older people leaving here. No, no, no. Babies are leaving here. Teenagers are leaving here. And it's only because of God's grace he left us here. But he left us here to do a work. Yeah. Yeah. Testify. <clears throat> Tell somebody about his goodness. Back to the basics. Father, move James out of the way. Hide me behind thy cross. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable in thy sight, for thou art my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You, remember, you remember being back in elementary school? Regulations. 
lining up at the door. I mean, that just didn't sit well. We all got to line up at the door and follow the leader. And you had to be good to be the leader, so that meant I wasn't hardly ever the line leader. You have to be good in school. You have to be good. The teacher said, I, don't, I want it so quiet in here. I don't want to hear no pen drops. I dropped my big pen. <laughs> Sunday school teaching Mrs. Young. After lunch, she grabbed her board and hit me 10 times. I hit my knees. She said, oh, get up. Because I was always into something. But elementary school. And I thought Miss Myron was an elementary school teacher I was going to use to say, oh no, Pastor, I'm the second grade. The teachers began teaching us math. It was all rudimentary at first, all foundational. It started out with addition. You use your fingers, you know, two plus three is five, you know. One, two, three, four, five, that's five. Then they started carrying one. I had a difficult time with carrying one. So you'd be using your popsicle sticks. Y'all remember that? Then they had an abacus, that is. Thank you, Miss Jennifer. Had the abacus, you count, it was all simple, wasn't it? Yeah. They used rocks, whatever you could use, marbles, you just use and do your math. Then they moved to subtraction, same thing. Five minus two, give you what? Four, three. Three, that's the answer. Five popsicle sticks, not two down, three. But then they moved on to multiplication. No, I like, no, that was Noah's response. Noah said, <laughs> That was mine too, Noah. Uh -huh. Multiplication got a little tricky. I had a great aunt that my dad set me up with. She was his Saturday morning date when he was my age. We had the same disposition. And he said, you having a hard time with math? I'm going to drop you off at your great auntie's house who happened to be a first lady uh -huh. with, a vivid, with a vivid vocabulary. <laughs> She had all kind of ways of telling you what she about to do to you. And so I just couldn't get mad down and so she would play the record. Y'all remember the records? Yeah. You had the onesies, the twos, the threes, all the way to the twelves. And she handed me a multiplication table and she said, boy, when I get through with you, you're going to be an A student. I said, yes, ma'am, but I didn't realize what that meant. That woman beat my knuckles. <laughs> Knuckles and head, click, clue, click, clue. I was a student, but I think I was mentally retarded when she got through with me. But what I didn't realize was is that everything was building the foundation for pre-algebra, algebra one, two, three, and four. My favorite subject, trigonometry, <laughs> on into calculus, chemistry and physics. Everything started with the elementary school teacher with that addition, yep. subtraction, yep. multiplication, yep. and division. Yep. They made sure you got your basics. But this morning, Apostle Paul wants us to understand the foundation. Because there's so many people that can quote a scripture but really don't know what it means. I got a picture of the Apostle Paul that I want you to see. He was a brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want 
want you to get that this morning. He was a brother. When you read about him, they say he had a forehead that stuck out. He was short with knobby knees and thick legs. They say he was not attractive at all. But he was the man God was using. And God chose Paul the unlikeliest of all candidates. He persecuted the church. He made sure people were killed for trying to serve Jesus. And now God flips the script on his life and say, you're going to now teach what you've been working against. He said, you're going to preach Jesus. And you're going to found churches and Gentile nations. He's preaching Christ and faith in Christ and Israel rejects salvation through faith. So in Romans 10 and 1, Paul says this. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So first off, it wasn't even really, it, wasn't, it was written to the Roman Christians but it was written because the Jews were rejecting the Christian message. My God, my God. Paul's message to the Christians at Rome is confess Christ. Now that's my first point. You and I need to go back to the basics. All right. we, we need to start confessing Christ. And somebody's wondering, what does confessing Christ mean? What does the word confess mean in the Greek? Because the New Testament is written in the Greek. It means to acknowledge. All right. yes, Lord. And so every time something good happens, the way to acknowledge it is to say, Lord, I thank you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You got a new car that you can pay the note on. Thank you, you got to tell the Lord, thank you. You got somewhere to lay your head at night. And a lot of us take that for granted, but just, just ride down the street there and see some folks on the side with a tent. And you realize that God loves all his children. And it's by the grace of God that I'm not sharing that tent with them. So confessing Christ is not just talking about Christ. Confessing Christ is acknowledging all his goodness towards you. I want you to look at your neighbor this morning and say, neighbor, you've got to acknowledge the goodness of the Lord. Your children are healthy. Your grandchildren are healthy. Your, your spouse is healthy. Or your spouse is going to be healed. You've got to start acknowledging the goodness of the Lord. I need you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, for far too long, we have been quiet about the goodness of the Lord. So the first point is just acknowledge him. Yes, Confession means to acknowledge. The knowledge, acknowledge Christ with your mouth. Huh. Acknowledge Christ. Let people know how good God has been to you. Yes. You, you got to acknowledge. Man, we can go to the hospital, some of us, huh. and we can just walk down one corridor huh. and pick out five, six rooms and walk in there and say, I, I'm not a chappy. Huh. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangel evangelist. I'm not an apostle or bishop. But I'm on a sign it this morning to let you know where you are. God can raise you up. But how do you know that I'm so glad you asked? And you need to go on down the line to because five years ago, four years ago, two years ago, three months ago, God raised me up. That's it. That's it. Thank you, Lord. He says, he says, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe. What does this word believe mean? To have faith in. So when I acknowledge him, that ain't just enough. Now I gotta have faith in Jesus. Because you can acknowledge, you can acknowledge something and still have no faith in it. <clears throat> I've seen this sometimes in husbands and wives. Yeah, that's my wife, but. <laughs> that's that's my husband. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, they acknowledge him, but they ain't got no faith in him. Yeah. So we've got to acknowledge and have faith. 
faith in Jesus. That God raised him from the dead. Why is that important? Because to the Jews, they would die for acknowledging Christ as Lord and Savior. People are dying because the Romans and the others, and even the Jews, did not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Realize this. If he raised him from the dead, he's now the son of God. Yeah. They didn't want to acknowledge. So now I got to acknowledge him. I got to believe. Right. And I've got to confess yes. Yes. that he was raised from the grave. Now, this is where I'm supposed to shout. Because if he was raised from the grave, Come on. hey, Come on. on my day, whenever they bring me down, Anybody left ought to be able to shout. Because Jesus is the first fruits of the harvest. In other words, he was the first one to get up. And the devil didn't want him to get up because he recognized if he get up, everybody who died him gets up. That's why we can shout at funerals. That's why we can praise God as we, 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 we cry, we weep. They get to the end of the sermon. I don't care what the sermon was. The, the sermon could have been taught by Mary had a little lamb. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't he die? He died. Yeah, he died. He died. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm throwing the field out of this guy playing, y'all. On Sunday morning, he died up. He grabbed me, yeah. turned me. 
you. Yes. Make you look at me. Because yes. all your life you ain't been paying no attention to me. Yes. I got to save you, but in order to save you, I got to pray on you. Thank you, brother. I found God. God ain't never been lost. Child, I found God. You ain't found God. He's never been lost. We were the ones lost. He grabbed us. He turned us around and imported faith in us. Bring me to my second point. You got a chief concern. And your chief concern is found in verse 11. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not That's it. That's word. be ashamed. Yeah. Ashamed means disgraced. Oh my God. Thank you. I'm saved by faith. Yes, sir. Thank you. When Martin Luther fell out with the Catholic Church, because we all come out of the Catholic Church, every denomination right. comes out of the Catholic Church. I'm going to mess you up. The Methodist Church yeah. is the founder of holiness. Come on, when you start talking about Church of God and Christ, on, when you start talking about Pentecostals, I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm glad you asked. We got educated. And once we got educated, we didn't want to praise it no more. But well, once we got the AKAs and Deltas and Omegas, I ain't knocking none of it. Ain't nothing wrong with it. But once we started climbing up, Social ladder, the social stratum. All of a sudden, we didn't want to shout no more. Oh, we got the grief behind our name now. We don't want to shout no more. But Methodist was the church that was on fire at one time. Look at your neighbors and neighbor. I need God to bring the fire back. I wish I had help you this morning. I'm not lying to you. Study it for yourself. The Methodist church. That's what the whole of this church was birthed out of. Every time you see them shouting and running around the churches and falling out. Solified. Solified. 
By faith alone. Martin Luther the Catholic Church had a falling out. Because they tried to say he was saved by works. Tell us that. Trying to do all the great works. Martin Luther got to this book called Romans and it messed him up. He said, no, I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by faith. Because watch this. You can have works and not have faith. Somebody said, I don't believe that. Okay, we do it every day. <laughs> On secular jobs that you don't really care for, you ain't got no faith in them. You just want to get paid. You may not even believe in what's going on. You just want to get paid. I had a friend who said, I'm just there to get paid. But when your heart is in it, well, whenever you run into somebody whose heart is in it, whether they get their check or not, they give their best. Whether they get acknowledged or not, they give their best. They'll work all night long. Sometimes my wife blows my mind. She'll sit there with a laptop and a laptop to midnight. I said, baby, you got off at four. What's going on? I can't even hold your hand. I can't even get a hug. Get a hug. <laughs> Dr. Finney had to tell him, I'm getting older, but I ain't cold. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want no church hug. I, I want a real hug. <laughs> All the kids gone. I mean, I really want to hug you. <laughs> and, and, I, and I recognize, I can't get too upset. Because I wouldn't respect her if she did not, it was if she was not committed. But when a person is committed, they get like Dr. Finney. Dr. Finney be putting them pictures up. And I be looking at Dr. Finney. You retired. What you back up there for? That's when you when, when you retire, can I say like Eddie Murphy said it? Retire. When you retire, you don't go. She go back and enjoy why? She's committed and she loves what she's doing. When you love what you're doing, you're committed. When we fall in love with Christ, we'll talk about him to everybody. Yes, Me and Brother Paul be out there playing golf together. I don't hardly beat him. We're going to have to work on that, though. He cheats a little bit, though, y'all. He kicks the ball, y'all. Watch this. In his conversation out there, he's not a preacher, not a deacon, not an evangelist, not a trustee, not a steward. But you hear him talking about God. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to acknowledge God. We are a fan of everything but God. Come on, son. Just go through Facebook and Instagram. Everybody cheering for their football team. Nothing wrong with it. I do too. Everybody just cheering. But then on a Sunday morning, everybody quiet. The same folk at the football game are the same folk in the church. Now let me say that again. The same folk at the football game are the same folk. I'm so glad. And we get up. I'm make that pastor preach longer than you need to. <laughs> we got to become a fan That's it. of God. That's it. So what does this faith mean? I'm glad you asked them real quick. The Israelites, when they're in the Exodus experience, God tells them, take the Lamb's blood, which is the equivalent to us is Jesus. Look, strike the lintel, strike the doorpost. I'm coming through, I'm killing everything. The only thing that's going to save you is not your being a Jew. 
What's going to save you is your faith in me. Your faith in what I said, if you obeyed what I said, you had faith in what I said. Not only did you have faith in what I said, you had faith in me. So the only thing that's going to save you when I come through with the death angel is you had faith in me. So when they did that, they struck it. When God came through, when the death angel came through, it passed over the house. They called it the Passover or the Exodus experience. So it is with you and I. Our salvation is in what God said. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Last point, and I'm through. Call on Christ. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord of all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm driving in the other morning. My wife hit me about 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm on I-10, and then I can't do nothing about nothing. I'm on I-10. She said, I can't get in touch with Jazz. Jazz now stays in San Antonio. We don't have eyes in San Antonio. We don't have no way of keeping up if Jazz is okay in San Antonio. <clears throat> so immediately, I felt panic come over. That's not her norm. You at 7 o'clock in the morning, she always calls her mom. That's right. Call her dad and say, hey, how you doing? I'm up. We doing well. But she said nothing. That was good. I said, well, hold on. Let me, you hang up. Let me see if I can get it. Because usually, I be the fussing one. <laughs> and they always answer my phone calls. They know I be fussing if you don't. Even though they pay their own bills. <laughs> That's just the dad in me. That's right. And so, I called, she didn't pick up. I said, was something wrong with Jazz? She usually will. She couldn't get to her mother. She said, mine, I don't want to hear this. Let me answer. So then I, I started panicking with my wife. I said, ho, 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 ho. Let us pray. Call on the name of the Lord. Yes, sir. Because the Bible say, he's near. Yes, sir. He's near. He's nearer than the empty seat sitting on the side of you. And that empty seat means there's no help there. Yeah. But God is that call on him. Mm -hmm. So Paul deals, and he, he looks at what he says, and I'm from, but there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. He deals with racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He deals with elitism. Because the Jews thought they were somebody. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. I mean, they thought they were somebody. I mean, yeah. that the, the nation was no bigger than Rhode Island. That, that's how big, when you look at Jewish territory, it was no bigger than Rhode Island in America. But they thought it was somebody, and, and they looked down on Gentiles. Wow. And then Paul comes with this word, there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. That's like American here. There's no difference between blacks and whites. <laughs> Same emphasis. That's how I know God is not with racism. That, that, that's how I know that God does not give prefer preferential treatment. Because he tells Paul, tell them there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Can we go a little deeper? There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, male or female. In other words, anything out there, there's no difference in them. He deals with their Jewish privilege. God chose them. That's the only difference. But then God decided he was going to graft us all in. And see, now I'm a doctor. I got my papers. Your daddy is my daddy. My daddy, my daddy is your daddy. I can show up at the synagogue and say, he's my daddy too. Abraham is my father. Father Abraham, that's mine too. Had many sons. I was one of the sons. I wish I had help this morning. You and I are grafted in. You, you and I are not bastard children. That's not a cuss word. All it means is I don't know my daddy. I know who my father is. I need to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I may not know my biological father, but I know that I know that I know my spiritual father. And he's, he's rich in grace toward us all. Solo Russia by grace alone. It's nothing you can do that will make your father disown you. 
Don't let nobody shame you. You did this and you did that. Be like me. Yeah, I did it. Uh, and if you saw it, you did it too. If you reach in the garbage can and pull it up after God delivered me, that's your garbage, not mine. God is rich in grace. Go to our Father and repent. Call on him. He's a forgiver. And he says this and I'm through. For whosoever, that's anyone who calls on Jesus Christ, shall be saved. So what does this word save mean? Delivered. And not only will you be delivered, not only will I be delivered, I'll be protected. I'm under a protection program. Not only am I delivered, not only did he pull me out of sin, but now he protects me. You got, you got a bodyguard around you all the time. You got two angels that are with you all the time. You want to know their name? I'll give it to you. Grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. Grandma, come here, please. Jarrell, come here, please, and I'm through. I want you to see Grace and Mercy at work.